Uh, good afternoon. We just completed today's meeting of the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force, and um, I couldn't be more proud uh, of the efforts of uh, the men and women standing behind me or all of those standing behind them. Uh, President Trump said from early on that this would be a whole-of-government approach, uh, and today gives evidence of the fact that it is also a whole-of-America approach. We're bringing the full resources to the federal government and the full resources of, uh, of this great economy and our great business sector to bear in protecting the American people and protecting American families. A few updates from today. Um, uh, as we continue to expand testing availability across the country, testing is now available at all state labs. By the end of this week, there will be more than 4 million more tests made available in jurisdictions around the country. One million are already in place. Thanks to the good work of our top commercial labs that the President Trump brought together yesterday, uh, uh, LabCorp and Quest are in the process now of distributing and marketing coronavirus tests all across America. And we're working with state and local officials uh, to ensure that that happens as rapidly as possible. Um, but as the testing is expanding, we wanted to make sure the American people uh, knew that testing uh, was available to them and that cost would not be a barrier. Today, President Trump assembled the top health insurance executives in America. Uh, and as we announced uh, earlier today, uh, all of our major health insurance companies have now joined with Medicare and Medicaid and agreed to uh, waive all co-pays, cover the cost of all treatment for those who contract the coronavirus. They've committed to no surprise billing, uh, and uh, they've committed to encourage telemedicine. Uh, it was a year ago uh, that Medicaid actually expanded to pay for uh, telemedicine. Medicare pays for telemedicine. So now for seniors who may think that they are either at risk or have contracted the disease, they can get medical advice without having to go to the doctor or go to an emergency room. Uh, I know I speak for President Trump when I say how grateful we are to see our health insurance industry step forward to meet this need so that, that no American should be concerned uh, about, uh, about being able to pay for or afford the cost of a coronavirus test uh, if they deem and their doctor deems it to be appropriate and necessary. The President also went to Capitol Hill today to meet with members of the United States Senate Republican Caucus. There he talked about an economic package, including a call he's calling for payroll tax relief. And uh, I think uh, most important to the President's heart, we want to make sure that hourly workers, hardworking blue-collar Americans that may not have paid family leave today, that small and medium-sized businesses in America would be afforded the resources to provide paid leave so that no one would feel that they have to go to work uh, if they might be infected or if they might have been exposed to the coronavirus. We had a, a good reception on Capitol Hill. Our legislative teams have fanned out. We're going to be working with Republican and Democrat leadership to move an economic package. Larry Kudlow will be reflecting on that uh, in just a few moments. Uh, we also talked about um, what are known as N95 masks, and we're working, uh, Senator Deb Fisher and others have important legislation that would extend temporary um, uh, liability protections so that masks that are made for industrial use could be sold to hospitals to ensure that our health care workers are properly protected and outfitted. And we're grateful for growing bipartisan support for that measure, uh, and we're going to be working earnestly with Republicans and Democrats to move a, a uh, reform that would make more uh, N95 masks available. I'm also uh, pleased to report that we did receive this afternoon a, a comprehensive proposal from the cruise line industry, a proposal that inc includes advanced screening, improving medical services on ships, providing for uh, airlift evacuation and land-based care uh, at the expense of the cruise lines for anyone that might be in not only infected with the coronavirus, but uh, with any serious illness. We'll be reviewing that in the next 24 hours. The President's objective is for us to make a cruise lines uh, safer, even as we work with the cruise lines to ensure that, that no one in our particularly vulnerable population 
uh, is, uh, is, is going out on a cruise um, in the near future. Uh, I'm going to recognize uh, uh, Dr. Fauci to talk about where we are. Um, uh, and Dr. Burks will give us uh, some research that she's done on the scope. We'll have other updates. But let me say once again, um, this is a whole of government approach. And from early on, President Trump has insisted that our, that our government at the federal level, all of our partners at the state level work in concert to protect the American people. And uh, as we stand here today, uh, the risk to the average American of contracting the coronavirus remains low. But we're absolutely determined to give every American the tools and the information that they need to protect themselves, their families, their, their workplace, their schools. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to work together. Uh, we're going to work together to see our way through this. Uh, and, uh, and working with leaders in both parties in Congress, working with, with leaders at the state level all across this nation, I'm confident we will. With that, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci for an update on the status. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Just to give you a very brief uh, sketch of what we do every day, the cases continue to increase globally. Uh, we're partic paying particular attention to the cases in Europe, in Italy, and France, in which we're starting to see that up at the same time as the relative number of new cases come down from China. What we're seeing in Europe is that Europe is in that upslope. So that's something that is expected. That's the way these kinds of outbreaks go. This is not a surprise to anybody if you look at the history of infectious diseases outbreaks. In the United States, we continue to have new cases as of this morning. There were 712, I believe, with 27 deaths guaranteed by the time of this evening. That's going to be up, and there'll be several more. And tomorrow, there'll be several more. So we realize that this is something, obviously, that we've been saying all along that we're taking very seriously. Now the question is, what are we going to do about that? And there are a number of things that one can do in order to blunt it. If you look at the curves of outbreaks, you know, they go big peaks and they come down. What we need to do is flatten that down. That would have less people infected. That would ultimately have less deaths. You do that by trying to interfere with the natural flow of the outbreak. So what we're saying today is that although we keep coming in and saying appropriately that as a nation, the risk is relatively low. There are parts of the country right now that are having community spread in which the risk there is clearly a bit more than that. And you know the places, you know, Washington State, California, New York, and Florida. But what I want to talk to you about today, just for a moment or two, is that we would like the country to realize that as a nation, we can't be doing the kinds of things we were doing a few months ago. That it doesn't matter if you're in a state that has no cases or one case. You have to start taking seriously what you can do now that if and when the infections will come, and they will come, sorry to say, sad to say, they will. But when you're dealing with an infectious disease, you know, we always have that metaphor that people talk about that Wayne Gretzky, you know, he doesn't go where the puck is, he's going where the puck is going to be. Well, we want to be where the infection is going to be as well as where it is. So what we have here, if, if you could see that here, what, it's here is that if you go to coronavirus.gov, remember when Dr. Burks yesterday mentioned some of the things that we put together. These are really simple. Keeping the workplace safe, keeping the home safe, keeping the school safe, and keeping commercial establishments safe. This should be universal for the country. Everyone should be doing that, whether you live in a zone that has community spread or not. When you have community spread, you're obviously going to ratchet up the kinds of mitigations that you have. But at a minimum, this is the minimum that we should be doing. So everybody should say, all hands on deck, this is what we need to do. So I'll stop there, and later I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Crouch. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Crouch. Vice President, and thank you, Dr. Fauci, for that clarity. We continue to monitor the situation across the country and across the globe, and we are very fortunate between Dr. Fauci and I, we have long-term contacts out there in many of these countries that are experiencing current outbreaks. We continue to review all the scientific literature to look for insights and to really determine who's at the greatest risk. And that's why we've talked to you about people with immunodeficiencies at any age, people with medical conditions, and the elderly. 
and how important it is for all of us to take these precautions in the household to protect others. Because we have circulating flu and other respiratory diseases at this time. We all have to act like all of those diseases, any respiratory disease, can be transmitted to others. And as we said yesterday, we're hoping that decreases all the respiratory disease we're experiencing. Finally, we got new reports out of China um, who had nine pregnant women um, during an acute COVID infection, and all nine were infected. Both, um, and they delivered while they were infected, and all nine babies were healthy, and the mothers were healthy. So we continue to look for data like that to be reassuring to the American public at the same time, ensuring that every single person is participating in this response to this virus and taking those precautions that we should be taking every day. If we start doing this today, we will be ready next year for any of our respiratory diseases because I think we'll be able to show that these simple, simple household, simple work, simple school, simple business approaches across the country can change all of our respiratory diseases. So we thank you for getting the message out. We thank you for the participating and ensuring in your households and in households around America that we're protecting all of those who need our support right now. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci. And this information is available at coronavirus.gov. And uh, uh, as we said, we can't say often enough, the risks of contracting the coronavirus to the average American remains low. But for senior citizens with serious underlying chronic health conditions, the potential for serious consequences is very real. And make no mistake about it, by practicing these habits in your home, in your school, in your business, you're not only protecting your health, but you're also protecting those uh, that are most vulnerable. Uh, with that, uh, for an update on our the progress that President Trump made today with our health insurance uh, companies, I'd like to recognize Seema uh, Verma. As the Vice President said, we had a terrific meeting with the insurance companies, a real example of a public-private partnership where they agreed to waive co-pays for testing, um, not do any surprise billing, and also cover the costs of the COVID virus-associated costs. Um, the other things that they did is they asked the President for more flexibility in Medicare Advantage plans. And the President agreed to do that, and so today we issued guidance to our Medicare Advantage plans that not only can they waive the costs for the test, but they can also go further to removing prior authors authorization requirements. Um, they can waive prescription refill limits. They can allow for mail delivery of prescription drugs and expand more access to telehealth services if they weren't offering that in their plan. Um, also at CMS, we continue to work with healthcare providers um, around infection control practices. We met with home health agencies and also hospitals. And today we issued guidance to dialysis facilities as well as home health agencies around infection control. There's been a great deal of attention about uh, the Grand Princess and uh, HHS working uh, with the Coast Guard, with the Department of Defense, is currently working through um, uh, disembarking uh, American passengers, returning uh, foreign nationals to their country. And I wanted to ask uh, the Secretary Azar to speak and update us on the progress. Thank you. So with regard to the Grand Princess, I wanted to first express our appreciation to Governor Newsom, to the mayor of Oakland, the people of Oakland, the longshoremen, the stevedores who've helped with bringing it in and clearing the clearing the dock area so that we can do all of our operations there. Uh, we've got Admiral Abel here with us today who's been leading the Coast Guard efforts. And then Deputy Secretary Began from State has done incredible work with our foreign partners to help with the repatriation of their nationals who are on board the ship. As of our data that I've got is as of noon Pacific time today. So this will have increased quite substantially since, uh, since my last update. But as of noon Pacific, we had 548 individuals who have been offloaded from the ship. 228 Canadians are already back in Canada, flown there I believe was overnight. 171 Californians <clears throat> were taken uh, by the government of California and are now at Travis, uh, Travis Air Base. Um, 26 individuals were sick and they're being tr they are being treated uh, for various, it could be from uh, the novel coronavirus, it could also just be we had some frail individuals who are sick that needed treatment. 
Um, our goal is to get all of the citizens of California off today uh, to be in the care of the, of the California state government, uh, as well as to get uh, the UK citizens off today so that they could be repatriated to the United Kingdom. Uh, we continue to work with other countries on all of those uh, maneuvers. Uh, we will have um, non-California residents who will be in transport to the bases at Dobbins and at uh, Lackland. Um, today, we hope, or tonight. Uh, so everything is progressing. It seems to be progressing well. We're using the highest isolation, quarantine procedures, medical screenings possible to ensure the safety of not just the passengers, but also of the, of the local communities and all of the healthcare workers and others, emergency responders are helping. So thanks to all of our partners for this, their help with this very complex operation. Yeah, well done. Good report. And, and let, let me echo the Secretary's appreciation to uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, the state of California, the city of Oakland. Um, uh, it has literally been a seamless partnership. Everyone on that ship will be tested, isolated and quarantined uh, as appropriate and uh, provided with treatment. The crew on the ship, um, uh, other than those who were ill, will be quarantined on the ship uh, offshore. Um, but it uh, really represented the kind of partnership and cooperation from every level of government uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, every American I know is grateful uh, to see. With that, on the economic uh, uh, front, uh, Larry Kudlow. Thank you, sir. Uh, yesterday in a meeting in the Oval, the President acknowledging there are going to be challenges on the health and economic side. He mentioned that he intended to bring the full power of the federal government to deal with these challenges. And accordingly, as Vice President said, uh, up at the uh, Republican Senate luncheon today, and he mentioned it uh, in this room yesterday, President Trump has unveiled his proposals, strong proposals, for a um, temporary uh, payroll tax cut holiday, uh, which I think he would prefer to last through the end of the year. Uh, also, administratively, as uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and others have suggested, uh, we are trying to, um, we will use assistance to unpaid uh, sick leave people, very important point. Also, small and medium businesses, another important point. And also, possibly, uh, to some distressed industries or sectors in the economy, maybe tax uh, deferral might be a useful tool uh, and other means. So this is a strong cross-the-board package. Uh, we are consulting with leaders in the House and the Senate uh, with respect to this package, and particularly the um, payroll tax holiday. Let me just say, coming into this difficult period, the economy is in fundamentally good shape. We saw a blockbuster jobs report last Friday. Uh, today, for example, uh, the Small Business Confidence Index, the NFIB Business Confidence Index, uh, registered a very strong uh, number, keeping its uh, near record high. The unemployment remains low at 3.5 percent. Um, other indicators look pretty good. We had a lot of momentum in the first quarter. Good thing. I recognize the challenges, and that is why we are proposing uh, these uh, fiscal measures uh, to combine with monetary measures that have already taken. And again, I repeat the President's words. It just struck me as his determination. He intends to bring the full power of the federal government to deal with these health and uh, economic challenges. Thank you. Well said. And, and a word from uh, Surgeon General Jerome Adams. General. Good evening, everyone. As Surgeon General, whether it's opioids or cigarettes or the coronavirus, my job is to help the American people understand how to live a healthy life. And I'm asking all of you, I'm imploring all of you to help share my prescription for America to overcome this coronavirus situation that we're in. There are three parts to it. Number one, know your risk. As you've heard many times, but it's still important to impress upon America, if you are immunocompromised, if you have chronic medical conditions, if you are over the age of 60, you are at higher risk. If you are a child or young adult, you are less likely to be impacted by the coronavirus. Number two, the second part of the prescription, know your circumstances. 
Are you in an environment where you can telework? Are you planning on going to large gatherings like church? Do you live in a community that is being particularly impacted by the coronavirus? And you can find out this information from your state or local health department. Does your state have a hotline that you can call into to help you assess symptoms? Again, knowing your circumstances. And number three, and this is the most important part, know what you can do to stay safe. And we have really leaned into coronavirus.gov. Please send people to that website. We've put the tools on there for individual groups, specific audiences, so that people can understand how to stay, stay, uh, stay safe. If we follow this prescription, we will. We will overcome the coronavirus. Uh, as Dr. Fauci said, we will see more cases. Unfortunately, we are likely to see more deaths. We have not hit the peak of this epidemic quite yet, but if we follow this prescription, then we will decrease the number of people who are impacted, we will decrease the number of people who will die, and we will more quickly get to the end of this situation. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Questions? Please. Mr. Vice President, uh, that poster right there, it says to avoid crowding, uh, consider uh, rearranging large activities. So will the Pence Trump campaign suspend campaign rallies and other activities? I think that'll be a, a decision uh, that's made literally on a day-to-day -day basis. I thought Dr. Fauci spoke to that yesterday very well, that we're going to, I'm, I'm very confident uh, that the campaign uh, we'll uh, we'll take the very best information and, and make the very best decision uh, going forward. But uh, uh, these proposals are are things that every American can do all across the country that that will reduce the risk of uh, either contracting or being exposed to the coronavirus. On the economic package, the word unveiled was just used, but so far the public has not seen it. Mm -hmm. How big is this package? How big is the uh, payroll tax cut going to be? When is the general public going to see what you all have put together? Right. Larry? Um, we are working out details right now, so I don't want to <clears throat> quote any numbers ahead of time. You know, you make a proposal, we're checking with the leaders uh, of both parties in both houses and see what uh, is doable and where the, you know, tough nuts are going to be. So I, d I don't want to get into any detail. I, I think the outline of the thing is very important. Uh, the payroll tax uh, holiday is probably the most important, powerful piece of this. But on the other hand, I want to draw attention. We can use uh, administration and executive authority, uh, again, to help uh, uh, unpaid sick leave people, which is very important. We can use it for the medium and smaller businesses, which is very important. Uh, other distressed sectors, uh, we have some leverage uh, on tax uh, deferral. We, we know, I mean, look, I will say again, as I have for quite some time, the economy is strong. We also know there are going to be problems ahead. We know there are going to be challenges ahead. Don't deny it. Uh, we'll see. I want to take that a day at a time and a fact at a time, a statistical release at a time. But anyway, this will be the broad package. And at some point in the, in the near future, we will outline a more detailed uh, package for you. Okay. Good. Uh, actually, maybe while Larry is still up there, unless you want to answer it, Mr. No, Vice President. Go right ahead. Uh, <laughs> the President proposed to the uh, GOP policy lunch today to remove the entire payroll tax from both employers and employees. That would be a 12.4 percent reduction. Back in 2010, we had a 2 percent reduction. Can you basically eliminate, for however number of months, the payroll tax without blowing a huge hole in the budget. And furthermore, the president told the lunch he'd, he'd like to make that cut permanent. How do you do that? You know, the payroll tax holiday is a bold move. It's a very bold move. And this has always been a bold president. And We've been cutting taxes and rolling back regulations and changing trade deals and opening up the energy sector and doing things that nobody thought we could do before, John. We've had pretty good economic results for it. Uh, we're in a challenge period now. I get that. So with respect to your question on the specifics, I think there will be a big, a big growth payoff. I, I think it will help deal with whatever challenges occur in the next few months. I think beyond that, uh, ameliorating the tax burden on the middle class, 
the so-called blue-collar boom that I talk quite a bit about. That's what this is aimed for. That's really what the payroll tax is principally about. Uh, by lifting the burdens of those middle class folks, I think we're going to get a big growth kicker. We've had a terrifically strong labor market, as you know. Um, it may stall a bit or not. I'm just speculating on the on the challenges of the on the health side. But I think over time, we'll make it up with much better economic growth. And I will remind also that later on, way down the road, uh, probably later this summer, early fall, we will unveil uh, another package of, uh, of tax cut and tax reform proposals. But yeah, it's a bold proposal, and this is a bold president, and um, I think it's paid off. If you were to make it permanent, can you backfill from general revenue to make up for, I mean, in fiscal year 21, Social Security, unemployment insurance, and Medicare Part A revenues are $1.23 trillion. Can well, you hide that money somewhere else? I just say, we're not talking about Medicare at this point. Um, I'm going to, the, the, by the way, the answer is yes, you can backfill it. And that has been done before because we've had other payroll tax cuts, and you mentioned one of them uh, in 2010 or 2011. So the answer to that is yes, and the answer is we will always maintain a solvent Social Security system. But you know, tax reform is very important, economic growth is very important, incentives for middle and lower income workers are very important. And I will just add, you know, in terms of the boldness of this president's policies, despite um, uh, what some of our uh, critics think. Actually, it's the middle and lower middle people that have done the best in wage growth terms. And I think this is absolutely consistent. This lifts tax burdens on the middle class. I think it's absolutely consistent with his earlier policies. And let me, and let me also say, John, if I can, that um, the other piece of this is, is what the doctors have said to us, what the experts have said is, um, if you're sick, if you have reason to suspect that you may have coronavirus, we want you to stay home. And the president's absolutely adamant, working with the Congress or using his executive authority to ensure that, that hourly workers, people working for small or medium-sized businesses that don't currently have paid family leave, uh, will be able to stay home and be confident that they're not losing a paycheck. I think every American can identify with that concern. And, uh, and we, we're going to work forward, whether we do it legislatively or the president has some, some, some resources in his executive authority to act, we're going to work to make sure that, that hourly workers don't feel like you have to go to work sick uh, because you're risking a paycheck. Get home, stay home, take those couple of weeks to get better. Um, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I want to drill down on something that Larry just said, though, because in, uh, in 2018, according to the Center for Budget, Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, federal payroll taxes generated $1.17 trillion, which is an enormous figure. And Larry, you're suggesting that you can make that up from general revenue. Where are you going to get a trillion dollars from? You know, uh, let us put the proposal out in concrete details mm -hmm. and flesh that out, and we'll have much better answers. Right now, I want to stay in my lane, and I think the health uh, story, the coronavirus story, is, uh, is very, very important here. We will do the best we can, Eamon, to give you specific plans and details once we flesh them out. Yes, please. Question about the uh, increased testing capacity. We're, right. we're still seeing reports of severe rationing in many cases because of the limited supply. It appears to be close to impossible for average Americans to get tested without being hospitalized first. So when can the American people expect to see these test kits available at doctor's offices, at urgent care, mm -hmm. at minute clinics, that sort of thing, specifically when? Well, I'm going to have the secretary step forward and address that. But let me say we've made great progress. Um, over the last week, a million tests are in the field. Every state lab in America can do coronavirus tests. If, you, if you're concerned that you have coronavirus, uh, your doctor can contact the state lab, can have a test uh, processed. Uh, by the end of this week, another four million tests will be distributed. But to your very important question, um, we're working day by day with the largest commercial labs in America. Uh, we had we had some good discussions today with outside experts as well, who said that uh, when the president brought the commercial labs in, he did exactly the right thing because it's those big companies that have logistics infrastructure all over the country, have labs all over the country, that can distribute the tests, process the tests, whether it's Quest or whether it's LabCorp, 
And we believe that in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to continue to see the availability of tests dramatically rise, and uh, we're driving toward that every day. Mr. Secretary, did you want to sure, add to that? Sure, maybe Dr. Redfield can add in um, oh. also. Um, <clears throat> So by the end of this weekend, we had 1.1 million tests that were actually shipped. We have another 1 million that are either in transit or waiting for orders. So we actually have a surplus capacity already of tests that have been produced. And as the Vice President said, by the end of this week, be another 4 million tests. So the tests are out there. The tests are in every public health lab in the country. They're in hospitals. They're in labs. But I think there's a false premise in your question, which is the notion that just because I as a person say, oh, I'd like to be tested for the novel coronavirus, I should be going to a minute clinic or some other facility and just walking and saying, give me my test, please. That's not how diagnostic testing works in the United States or, frankly, almost anywhere in the world. Trump said on Friday, said anyone who wants it's to get always tested can if their doctor, we've always been clear, if their doctor or public health physician believes they should be tested, it needs to always be clinically indicated to receive a test. So it's a false premise. Go to your doctor if you, first, actually don't go to your doctor, call your doctor's office if you believe you may have the novel coronavirus. Call the clinic, call the hospital, call the doctor's office so that you don't just walk right in, follow their infection control procedures for doing that. And then they will decide, working with you, whether a test is appropriate to be done. But there are millions of tests out there now, and it's going to, as the Vice President said, with Quest and LabCorp getting it at the doctor's office, swabbing their, their distribution and transport system, it's going to be an even better, closer to the patient experience, as I prom as I talked to you on Saturday when we met together. That's very good. And uh, answer, I'm going to ask Dr. Burks to speak to this, too, because uh, uh, she's just done a tremendous job bringing our commercial labs to bear on this. But to your other point, um, the president directed us to essentially change the, the criteria that CDC was giving labs around the country. We heard from governors around the country that people that were only mildly symptomatic were being told that they couldn't be tested. We changed that. We changed that description. And so, as the president said, anyone who, on a doctor's order, wants to be tested can, at a doctor's indication, be tested now. We're working to fill that need, um, and it, we're making great progress every single day. But I wanted Dr. Burks to speak to it as well. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about what happened in decreasing barriers. I've, I've been a lab person, I've been a vaccine developer, I've been a doctor, I've been all those things, but I've never in my lifetime of government service have worked with the CDC in a way that every time the state or local government calls and says, I have this barrier, I need a modification to the regulations. That has happened almost daily. And the reason we have commercial labs willing to step in immediately is because the FDA has created that ability and posted on their website, I don't know if you've been there, this unbelievable waiver system and the clear definitions there. Every single hospital, every single university can utilize this testing algorithm. And that's highly unusual, but it's also what's bringing the super large high throughput companies to the, to the table. And I just wanna, this has been unique for me to be able to see this unbelievable dialogue between what states need, what local governments need, and federal government being responsive with changing those regulations. And that has been really wonderful to watch. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Can I get you right here? Yes, um, I wanted to ask, I guess the administration has really touted the success of the travel ban on China and Iran. Why has it not extended those um, bans to South Korea or Japan or Italy? And is it still under consideration, or has the administration really shifted to mitigation from containment? Well, I, I'm going to let I'm going to let uh, Dr. Burke speak to that in a moment. But uh, there is no question, uh, as Dr. Fauci said just a few days ago. We would be in a very different place if President Trump had not suspended all travel from China. Um, and we would also, uh, I suspect, be in a very different place uh, if we hadn't issued travel advisories uh, for portions of Italy, portions of South Korea, and initiated uh, 
screening of all passengers on all direct flights into the United States uh, from both of those countries. I, I will tell you, we had a very, uh, we had a very uh, uh, thorough discussion today of the prospect of recommending to the president additional travel advisories. What we're doing, particularly as Dr. Fauci said, is we're following the facts. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to bring those recommendations forward in the time and manner uh, that we, as, as the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force, determine are appropriate. But let me tell you, it is literally a day-to-day -day consideration, uh, and we're going to continue to put uh, the health and safety of America first. Dr. Burks, did you want to amplify that? Or I think that was perfectly said. Dr. Dr. Fauci, did you want to Thank you. Uh, Tom Bosser, who used to be a part of this administration, yeah. uh, had an op-ed where he basically said that the U.S. has 10 days before hospitals could be overrun. He recommended that schools be shut down for maybe eight weeks. And what does the administration think about that? Does, does it agree uh, that, we, that the U.S. could be at the point where there could be a turning point in the next 10 days or so? And what about keeping schools open? Should they be kept open? Well, let me say the recommendations that you have and that every American now has at, at coronavirus.gov apply to every jurisdiction in the country, every state and every community, irrespective of whether or not there's been a coronavirus case established. I will tell you that we're working very closely uh, with uh, California, Washington, New York, Florida uh, to develop community-specific recommendations for those areas where we have had what is known as community spread, uh, a number of coronavirus cases that appear that is being transmitted in the community. In the next 24 hours, uh, working with those states, we'll, we'll be publishing uh, CDC's recommendations uh, for what ought to be done. But um, I, I want to uh, turn it over to Dr. Fauci to tell you that we, we really think the most important thing here is that we continue to bring the facts forward to the American people and that, uh, and that our, our proposals and our recommendations, while, while all of these apply to everybody in the United States and it'll help reduce uh, the infection rate of the coronavirus, um, that for those communities that are being impacted, we're going to develop specific recommendations that'll make the most sense for them. Dr. Fauci? Thank you. Whether is it? Can you wait until there's community spread to make some of these decisions? Well, you know, it depends on the degree of community spread. I mean, community spread could be just a small amount, or you could start to see multiple generations. But getting to your individual individual question, that everything is on the table for consideration. So the idea that we're not closing all, I mean, I think for the country right now to say we're going to close all the schools in the country, I don't think would be appropriate. Would school closures be appropriate depending upon mm -hmm. not whether you have uh, already the horses out of the barn, but when you start to see we're getting a little bit dangy here, so let's do it. So. It's incorrect to say, now everything has happened bad, let's close the school. And it's incorrect to say, let's just blanket close the schools in the entire country tonight. I don't think that that would be appropriate. But I do think it would be appropriate to carefully try and do things like closing, but there's other things besides closing, to do real mitigation sometime before you think you really need it. That gets back to what I said a few moments ago about where the puck is going to be. But you want to make sure you're not so far ahead that you overshoot. Great. All right, thanks, guys. Just real quick. Uh, should the president stop shaking hands with people? He just did it at the Medal of Freedom ceremony a few moments ago. On this uh, sign up here, it says you should stop uh, handshaking if you're at uh, your workplace and you're in your school or in commercial establishments. Should the president set that example? I notice you've been opting for the elbow bump. Uh, I've been shaking hands, too. <laughs> What, what do you make of that? Is, is that necessary, do you think, at this point? Well, look, as the president has said, uh, in our line of work, uh, you shake hands when someone wants to shake your hand. And uh, I expect uh, the president will continue to do that. I'll continue to do it. Uh, what, what this is is a broad recommendation for Americans. Um, but a really good recommendation is to wash your hands often. And, and the, all the experts tell me 
that while while people want to want to get the uh, various sanitizing lotions, um, washing your hands with hot soap and water for 20 seconds is just as good as any lotion you can buy. So, how about, right there. How about one or two more? Is, uh, is it a plan to coordinate a response with other countries? Uh, I'm sorry, say again. Is it a plan to coordinate a response with other countries in the continent? President Trump met president from Brazil, Bolsonaro, this weekend. Did they talk about coronavirus? Uh, I, I know that they spoke about a broad range of issues, and I'm confident the coronavirus was discussed. Um, what, I, what I can tell you is that um, our focus is on the health and well-being of the American people. Uh, we're going to continue to communicate uh, uh, with nations across this hemisphere and across the country. Uh, but uh, what the president's uh, given us as a mission of the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force is to uh, see to the health and well-being of the American people, and we'll continue to make recommendations to do uh, just that. How about one more? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, two questions. One on Washington State. They made a request uh, of a strategic stockpile for, uh, they said, 233,000 masks, and they received half of that. I'm wondering uh, if, if that report is inaccurate, yeah, please uh, speak to it. And secondly, on cruise lines, uh, are you looking at a bailout for cruise lines? Uh, several of these companies are tax exempt. So, so, so they got half of the shipment from the strategic national stockpile initially, and then when the vice president actually went out to the state of Washington, that's when the second half of the shipment arrived. But I have spoken directly with Governor Inslee, with whom we've had a superb working relationship, and he has informed me that there are some additional personal protective equipment needs that a couple of their hospitals have, and we're working through the strategic, strategic national stockpile to make sure we're, we are directing and fulfilling shipments to them as needed. I, I want to echo again uh, our gratitude to Governor Inslee and, and all the health officials in the state of Washington. I was there last week. Our teams are working very closely uh, together. Uh, we'll follow up on that public report, but the secretary has indicated. But look, we're, uh, in, as I said, in the next 24 hours, uh, uh, we will be working with not only Washington State, but California, with New York, with Florida, um, and, uh, and unveiling our recommendations, CDC's recommendations to those areas that have been impacted by uh, community spread, and then we'll continue uh, to come alongside those communities to do everything in our power to mitigate the spread. But let me just say again as a resource, thank you all. We'll be back here again tomorrow. Uh, coronavirus.gov, practical information for every American, details for state labs that may yet have questions about performing their own tests. We have specifics, enzymes, agents, ingredients that uh, that where they can be acquired and how for the performance of coronavirus tests. Oh, but for every American, I just want to say again, uh, remember the, well, the risk to the average American of contracting the coronavirus remains low. But however, the, the risk to senior citizens with serious underlying chronic health conditions is very significant. And it's important for all of us to continue to take all the steps necessary to look after the most vulnerable, to look after our health. And I'm confident that we'll get through this together. Thank you.